viewers and welcome to African Anecdotes TV. Today we are taking a look at African queens who had a strong anti-colonial spirit. And the first queen we are looking at is Queen Nzinga. Queen Nzinga has been described as a brave and intelligent warrior who became one of the key figures in the resistance of African people against colonialism in the 17th century. Queen Nzinga was the leader of the Mbundu people and queen of Ndongo and Matamba in southwest Africa, in what is commonly now known as Angola. This area became well known in 1575 when Portuguese soldiers invaded Ndongo in search of gold and silver. Born eight years after the invasion, Queen Zinga joined the resistance against the Portuguese along with her father, King Gola Mbandi Kiluanji, from a very young age. When Gola died in 1617, one of his sons, Gola Mbandi, took over power. However, he did not have his father's charisma, neither did he have his sister, Queen Zinga's, intelligence. And so the king relented and delegated power to his sister, who was a great strategist and fluent in Portuguese, thanks to the education she was given by missionaries. And her brother delegated some power to his sister because of the issues and the troubles that he was having with the Portuguese. And therefore, Queen Zinga was given the responsibility to negotiate with Portugal and to sign a peace agreement. When Queen Zinga arrived in Luanda, she saw a shocking sight. Slaves were lined up, sold, and placed on large ships. In just a few years, Luanda had become one of the largest points of sale and distribution of slaves throughout Africa. When she visited Portuguese governor Joao Correa de Souza's palace to begin the peace talks, Queen Zinga carried out a scene that was full of symbolism. She noticed that while the governor was sitting in a comfortable armchair, there was nothing for her to sit on except for a rug on the floor. Without speaking a single word and with only a glance, one of her servants knelt down and reclined in front of the governor. Queen Zinga sat on the servant's back so that she could be at the same height as the Portuguese ruler. It was Queen Zinga's way of expressing that she would speak to the governor on an equal footing. After the negotiations, the two sides agreed to the withdrawal of the Portuguese troops from Dongo and the recognition of Dongo sovereignty. In exchange, the territory would be open for the Portuguese to create trade routes. Do you think that the Portuguese kept their end of the bargain? In 1626, Nzinga became queen of the Bundu when her brother committed suicide in the face of rising Portuguese demands for slave trade concessions. Other accounts state that her brother died in suspicious circumstances. Whatever the case, Queen Zinga was now in authority. In 1627, after forming alliances with former rival states, she led her army against the Portuguese, initiating a 30-year war against them. Queen Zinga also forged an alliance with Dutch slave traders, and she used her wealth to consolidate her position. Even when she was well into her 60s, Queen Zinga still personally led troops into battle. One thing you will notice is that Queen Zinga was a great strategist. She gave asylum to all fugitive slaves from Portuguese controlled territory. She induced African soldiers who had been trained by the Portuguese to join her army by promising them land and other rewards. And she led her men to infiltrate the Portuguese army to incite the Africans within it to desert. 
Queen Zinga also orchestrated guerrilla attacks on the Portuguese, which would continue long after her death and inspire the ultimately successful 20th century armed resistance against the Portuguese that resulted in independent Angola in 1975. Despite repeated attempts by the Portuguese and their allies to capture or kill Queen Zinga, she died peacefully in her 80s on December 17th, 1663. She has a special position in Angolan history and is seen as an important root of African nationalism. Empress Taitu Betul. Taitu Betul, whose name means sunshine, regarded as one of Ethiopia's greatest leaders, was the wife of Emperor Menelik II. Together, they ruled Ethiopia from 1889 to 1913, and she was quite instrumental in defeating Italian imperialists. She is the one who chose the area of Ethiopia's present-day capital city and named it Addis Ababa. Taitu Betul and Menelik's marriage was a powerful political union as both parties brought alliances in northern and southern Ethiopia, respectively, to the table. Taitu's role was not to look pretty at the emperor's court, but she was also firmly involved in most political decision-making, diplomacy, and military campaigns, as you will shortly see. Empress Taitu was also educated, unlike many women in her time. She also liked to play chess, and she played the stringed beginner. She is known to have kickstarted many national industries, including wine production, candle making, and more. Emperor Menelik, who would be considered nice because he was uncomfortable with making firm decisions, would consult her prior to making important decisions. And due to her intelligence and loyalty for the throne, and for her country, he endorsed her views and proposals. Taitu went on to play a key role in the conflict over the 1889 Treaty of Muchale, which was written in Amharic and Italian. Well, what did the treaty say? The Amharic version recognized the sovereignty of Ethiopia and its relationship with Italy as just a diplomatic partnership. But what did the crafty and devious Italians do? They had written in the Italian version that Ethiopia was to be Italy's protectorate. Once Empress Taitu found out about the Italians' crafty plan, she immediately told her husband to declare war on the Italians. Her stance against the Italians earned her the title of a stubborn woman because not only did she put pressure on her husband not to make any concessions to Italy, but she insisted that no diplomatic courtesies should be accorded to the Italians in any diplomatic correspondence with them. Italy then decided to attack Ethiopia from the Eritrean side. Taitu is said to have commanded 5,000 infantry and 600 cavalry in the fight against the Italians. She mobilized thousands of women and encouraged them to take part in the fighting and care for the wounded soldiers. She scored a significant victory at an Italian-built fort in Mekele, where she defeated the Italians by cutting off their water supply. The Italians suffered from shortage of water. And finally, they surrendered their partially completed fort in a city which they had occupied since 1895. In 1909, Menelik suffered a stroke and Taiti took over much of the political work, effectively ruling the country herself. After some time, it is said that her rivals in the royal family pressured her into giving up power. And some historians believe that she had become too powerful for the liking of many at the court. When Menelik died in 1913, 
Taitu was ousted from the main palace and her political influence faded. She died in 1917 and was buried next to her husband at the Taeka Negest Bayat Le Mariam Monastery in Addis Ababa. Nevertheless, Empress Taitu will always remembered will always be remembered as a formidable force in the fight against Italian colonialism. Queen Muhumuza. As the colonizers continued in their efforts to subjugate the people of East Africa, a movement ensued against colonialism in southwestern Uganda and northern Rwanda. Its leader, a warrior queen, named Muhumuza. Following the death of King Rabugiri in 1895, Queen Muhumuza was left widowed. Despite her willingness to lead in the clamor for the throne after the king's death, Muhumuza was sidelined as a result of a power struggle between the diseased king's male relatives. Muhumuza fled north to Mpororo with her son after this conflict, and she was able to rally the Abakiga people of southern Uganda behind her as she began to claim the throne. In response, Musinga, who was on the throne, asked the German colonizers to help defeat the Muhumuza movement. Muhumuza became increasingly hostile towards European colonialists who were manipulating Musinga to enforce themselves in the region. Queen Muhumuza was arrested and jailed in 1908 by German and collaborating Rwandan forces for her continued aggression against the colonial powers. She escaped from Bukoba in 1911 and returned to Uganda, but found the political situation had changed as European-led forces were now established. She later proclaimed herself as Queen of Ndorwa. Present day Kigezi, she spearheaded another anti-colonial uprising and declared that she would drive out German and British colonialists. Muhumuza launched her last attack against the opposing forces in the form of an ambush on members of the Anglo-Belgian-Germany Boundary Commission. Unfortunately, the British responded by killing 40 of Muhumuza's fighters, as well as shooting her in the foot before finally capturing her. Muhumuza was seen as a great threat by the colonizers and therefore was deported to Mengo in Kampala, where she died in prison in 1944-1945. Many believed that Queen Muhumuza to be the incarnation of Nyabingi, the legendary female spirit. And even now in the Rastafarian movement, there is a subgroup known as Nyabingi, which attempts to keep the link between Rastafarian faith and African heritage very close. As can be seen from these three stories, African women played a pivotal role in the anti-colonial fight that took place in this great continent, although their stories have often been put in the back burner. Hopefully, with the awakening that is currently taking place, that will change. This has been African Anecdotes, guys, and see you in the next video.